How was your day today? John DCQR reporting from somewhere in Toronto, Canada. Today I want to talk about the McCarthy hearings of 1950. The news media would have us believe that the congressional hearings which were chaired by Senator Joseph McCarthy were held for the express purpose of exposing American citizens who were believed to be communist subversive elements. In actuality, the McCarthy hearings mainly targeted members of the Hollywood movie community who merely were communist sympathizers, not subversives intent on the overthrow of the United States government. Only a few of those targeted, for example, Hollywood journalist Cedric Belfrage and movie producer Boris Moros were identified in the Verona intercepts as KGB agents. Even to this day, victims of McCarthyism, many of whom were denied employment in the movie industry in the aftermath of the hearings for several years, apparently are unaware that the sole purpose of the congressional hearings was to misdirect the attention of the news media and the judicial branch of government away from a powerful faction within the Russian intelligence system known as the Trust. In order to comprehend why such a political charade was perpetrated and why McCarthy was chosen, to chair the hearings, we must first examine the origins of the subversive organization known as the Trust, which even at the present time exerts a major influence upon global affairs. Constantinople, the capital of the mighty Byzantine Empire, which had been founded by the half-English Constantine, was known as the Second Rome after the fall of the Roman Empire. One of the most heavily fortified cities in the world, Constantinople became besieged in 1453 AD by the army of Sultan Mehmed II, who was the ruler of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. The city's defense force of 10,000 troops was no match for the more than a hundred thousand Turkish invaders. After fifteen days, the enormous Turkish cannons successfully breached the city walls, using trumpets to distract the defenders. The Sultan's troops stormed into the city, but were repelled with heavy losses. After several more attempts, troops from the Sultan's ships, which had been blockaded in the city sea defenses stormed the shore to reinforce the besieging army which then was able to capture the city and so ended the Byzantine Empire but in but only in name. The fall of Constantinople had been orchestrated by the oligarchic banking families of Venice who had controlled the economies of Europe since the 9th century AD due to its geopolitical location between eastern and western trading blocks. In order to provide credit between Constantinople and Britain and all trading centers in between, noble Venetian banking families had created specialized banking institutions, thus enabling Venice to play a pivotal role in European politics. The Venetians had provided the Sultan with artillery and mercenaries. After the conquest, the Sultan awarded the Venetians large tracts of land in Byzantine Greece, where the Paleogus were the most prominent family, and also provided them with the authority over the Ottoman intelligence service. The Paleo Paleogues were, the, were a Greek branch of the Viterbo family of Italy. Their statesman, George Gemethos, established an alliance with Cosimo de' Medici of Florence, 
which led to the Ecumenical Council of Florence held in 1389 A.D. The deposed Emperor Constantine Paleogu found sanctuary in Rome. In 1472, his daughter Zoe changed her name to Sophia and married Ivan III of Russia. Sophia successfully persuaded her new husband to adopt the Byzantine title of Caesar, Tsar and Muscovite Russia, and the Byzantine imperial ideology and totalitarian rule. In establishing their clients, the Habsburgs, as rulers of the fledging Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Venetian bankers were able to play the Habsburgs and the Ottoman Empire against each other to the advantage of the Venetians. The sacking of Rome by the Habsburgs in 1527 enabled the Venetians to gain political control of all of Europe except for France and Tudor England. The Venetians and their Genoese banking allies founded funded the Stuart coup involving the Cecil family, which established King James I on the English throne. In return, James appointed the Venetian Genoese-owned Levant Corporation as the official collector of British taxes. This appointment enabled the corporation to attain a prominent position in the commercial affairs of Britain. Now moving on. Prince Vladimir, born 972, died 1015, was a disenchanted man. Rape and pillage no longer excited the Russian barbarian. The 200 concubines he kept at Berestov, north of 300 at Vychigarad, north of even the 3,000, give or take a few, who were maintained at Bielgorod for his exclusive pleasure, made him contented anymore. Poor Vladimir eventually concluded that what was lacking in his life was a religion capable of uplifting his soul. Atop the precipitous sandy cliffs of his capital city of Kiev, overlooking the Dnieper River, Vladimir ordered the construction of a statue of a statue of the Slavic deity Purin, which bore a silver head and a beard of gold, sacrificing a Varangian father and son at the base of the idol did nothing for the barbarian soul. Not to be defeated in his religious quest, Vladimir dispatched ambassadors to various nations with orders to report back on religions deemed capable of fulfilling the prince's spiritual needs. Evaluating the various reports, Vladimir disliked the notion of circumcision and so rejected Judaism. Islam fared no better since it forbade the consumption of alcohol, a Russian national pastime. Catholicism he considered lacking in ceremonial majesty. The reports that he received from the ambassadors who had returned from Constantinople, however, left him amazed. They had been awestruck by the glorious religious ceremonies of the Eastern Orthodox Church, which were attended by the emperor and his court and the opulence of the sacerdotal vestments worn by the high priest. This obviously was the preferred religion for a Russian barbarian prince. To become a member of the Eastern Christian Church necessitated that Prince Vladimir undergo baptism. This presented a problem, for the proud Russian barbarian found it unacceptable to humble himself before the Byzantine Empire, Emperor. Answering to no one, Vladimir resolved the thorny problem simply by capturing several Greek priests together with the requisite sacred relics, of course, 
who conducted the baptismal rite on the prince in the captured Byzantine city of Cherson. Where, oh yeah, returning to his capital city of Kiev, Prince Vladimir ordered the statue of the deity Purin to be flogged, then dispatched to a watery grave in the river Dnieper, with much to the consternation of the superstitious townsfolk, who were promptly ordered into the frigid river for a mass baptism. Vladimir now was a spiritually contented individual, according to the historian Nestor, and rather remarkably eventually attained sainthood. Prior to his religious conversion, Prince Vladimir, like his predecessors, was merely a tribal leader, not a sovereign ruler. Vladimir's conversion to Byzantine Christianity gradually transformed Russia for his captive Greek priests introduced not only their Byzantine religion but also Byzantine governmental doctrine. No longer were his soldiers free to quit whenever they elected to do so, for now they were part of an imperial standing army whose commander-in-chief had become a majestic sovereign overlord with power bequeathed him from God. Unlike other Slavic nations such as Poland who became satrapies of the Roman Church with its lack of separation between religious and secular matters, Vladimir and fortuitously received Christianity from Byzantium where the Eastern Christian Church leaders refrained from intruding into governmental matters, was free to govern without clerical interference, and thus Russian beca Russia became a Christian nation. As was mentioned previously, the overthrow of the Byzantine Empire was perpetrated with the assistance from the Venetian bank and oligarchy. Soon after Ivan III had married so, he was persuaded by the Venetian Senate to declare Moscow the third Rome as a successor to Rome and Constantinople. This ideology was later popularized by the 16th century Russian Orthodox priest Philotheos of Pskov. A major reform of what was now the Russian Orthodox Church occurred in 1654 when the Church Patriarch Nikon, concerned over errors made by the priests several centuries earlier during the course of the translating Byzantine religious texts into Old Slavic, prompted him to adopt the texts and practices of the Greek Orthodox Church as they existed in 1652, the year he was elected Patriarch. The Patriarch's religious reform sent shockwaves throughout Russia. Led by Archpriest Abakum Petrovich, millions of Russians who preferred the earlier religious format rose in opposition initially in the more remote peasant regions of Russia than later in Moscow. A series of church councils endorsed the Reformation and Avakum together with other leading dissenters were executed. The dissenters known as the Raskolniki Old Believers possessed of a blood and soil national ideology, the Raskoniki were resistant to change in both religious and secular matters. In later years they were to oppose the reforms of Peter the Great who attempted to westernize Russia and also Tsar Alexander II who had threatened Britain to refrain from interceding in the American Civil War. A major Raskolniki ideologue of the 19th century 
was the writer Fyodor Dostoevsky, and he was also a Jesuit coadjutor, but moving on. It cannot be overemphasized that Raskolniki influence in Russian affairs as state is not a thing of the past, for its overturns of Byzantine imperialism still exerts a powerful influence among Russian political leaders, civil and military, and also in the hierarchy of the Russian imperial church. All of these factions are intent upon establishing Moscow as the Third Rome by force if necessary. The ultranationalistic Russian organization Pamyat is simply a new bottle for this very old wine. Until the disintegration of the Soviet Union, both the nomenclature of the Soviet Communist Party and the great military strategist Marshal Ogarkov embraced the Byzantine oligarchical social order of the Raskolniki. At the present time, it was stated in it was, as was stated at the present time, Russia is conspiring to effect a grand deception by creating the illusion that it has become a second class global power. In actuality, at the apparent dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Raskolnik power structure simply transferred much of Russia's wealth together with many of its ruling members overseas, leaving second-level bureaucrats such as Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin to front and every other Russian leader to front for the real Russian covert power structure with its attendant Byzantine-oriented totalitarian blood and soil ideology. This is typified by the fact that during the year prior to becoming the pur purported Russian head of state, Vladimir Putin undertook five clandestine trips to the Spanish estate, a Russian power broker and multi-billionaire Boris Borisovsky. During the, year to, during the year prior to becoming Russia's head of state, Vladimir Putin covertly flew to Gibraltar, then boarded a fast launch, which secretly transported him to Boris Berezovsky's Spanish beachfront estate on five separate occasions. The fact that his plane clandestinely landed at Gibraltar on each of the five visits suggests that Britain was privy to the meetings. Could that also be one of the reasons that Slobodan Milosevic had to be eliminated? I'll talk more about that later. Now moving on. Much has been written in conspiracy-oriented books concerning the funding of the Russian revolution by Illuminist members of the City of London and Wall Street financial houses, but little had been, has been said regarding the role of the same Venetian oligarchic banking families who inspired Ivan III in his attempt to create Moscow as the Third Rome. It was a Venetian-Swiss-Austrian intelligence network under the direction of Venetian diplomat Volpi de Maserata, who persuaded the German Foreign Office to provide funding and a safe passage for the former Russian Jesuit seminary student and Satanist Lenin to covertly re-enter Russia from his exile in Switzerland for the purpose of igniting the Bolshevik Revolution. Volpi's principal spy was Alexander Israel Helfand, a Russian Jew who was born in Odessa on the Black Sea. Helfand, codenamed Parvis, was paid a very large sum of money by the British oligarchy 
to oversee the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, the infamous event which initiated World War I, and he was also one of the key players in the modern day founding of Interpol. After the Russian Revolution had become a reality, Lenin's dreaded secret police agency known as the Cheka was under the direction of spy master Felix Derzinski, a beady-eyed gnome-like Polish activist who had spent many hard years in the jails of Tsar Nicholas II. It was through the relationship between Derzinski, Volpi, and Helfond that the intelligence organization called the Trust was spawned. The death of Tsar Nicholas II and his family remains a mystery. The official version which holds that the entire family was shot, then buried in a wooded area is false. Some investigators claim that others were shot to conceal the fact that the Romanovs' lives were spared after signing away the Tsar's rights to the Romanov fortune much of which residing in Rothschild and Rockefeller banks. What the offer, what, what is known is that Princess Mary Nikolaevna Romanova no, was Empress of Russia by her father, was ransomed, was named An Empress of Russia by her father, then ransomed for a large sum of money. Assuming the alias Countess Sapska, she later married and quietly settled in the south of France. Now we move on. The trust was and still is an intelligence cabal and command center which operates on behalf of certain Illuminati oligarchic parties in Russia and also in various western nations. In its formative years, it also included high-level members of the Tsarist secret police agency known as the Okrana. And curiously, the editors of the Executive Intelligence Review in the book called Dope Inc. had a chapter called the FBI and American Okrana. Could it also be possible that J. Edgar Hoover may have been compromised by such organization as the Trust? That's just something to consider. During the 1930s, Stalin became alarmed at the manner in which Western oligarchical members of the Trust were looting the Soviet Union of his natural resources and grain production which consequently created a schism within the trust. The schism was finally healed with the death of Stalin, who, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, died under mysterious circumstances. The oligarchic members of the trust, through their influence on global geopolitics, have generated vast fortunes for themselves at the expense of the masses. This is particularly so thorough. Their creation of the phony Cold War whose principal architect was Sir Winston Churchill. This Cold War period financially benefited the corrupt military industrial complex. It was precisely to misdirect attention away from the oligarchical machinations of the trust that the McCarthy hearings were held. Senator Joseph McCarthy's political handler was Father Edmund Walsh, the Jesuit regent of the Georgetown University Foreign Service School. Here it should be noted that the Society of Jesus, popularly known as the Jesuits, was created by Ignatius Loyola in 1540 AD as an intelligence agency under the patronage of the Contarinis, a Venetian noble family involved in banking. 
prior to escaping from his incarceration on the island of St. Helena, Napoleon noted that first and foremost the Jesuits are a military order. The Jesuits organization is structured along Freemasonic lines and has a long history of involvement in political affairs of state. These affairs include orchestrating the American Revolution whose perpetrators acting on behalf of the Jesuit Superior General Lorenzo Ricci included the third Earl of Butte advisor to King James King George the third the Jesuit professor John Carroll and his cousin Charles even the first colonial flag was selected selected by a flag committee headed by General George Washington and Benjamin Franklin was the house flag of the Jesuit controlled British East India Company which consisted of a Union Jack and 13 stripes. The Jesuits were also very much involved in the assassination of Presidents Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy the latter having incurred the wrath, wrath of the Jesuit superior general and his American asset Cardinal Spellman for intending to halt the Vietnam War, thus preventing the genocide of many Vietnamese Buddhists, Buddhism being an anthema to the Jesuits, as, as are all non-Catholic religions. In the aftermath of the bloody revolution of 1917, it was only natural for Western powers to infiltrate intelligence operatives into the Soviet Union in order to effectively monitor the internal political power struggles. Many of these spies were members of the International Red Cross in order to gain access to the fledging Soviet Union. In a similar matter, the Vatican sent Father Walsh to Russia in 1922 to become head of a papal relief mission. Despite the enmity which exists between the Vatican hierarchy and the Jesuits, the Jesuit headquarters at the Piazza del Gesù in Rome, Hence the letter G in the Masonic local, logo, selecting Walsh for the task made good strategic sense, for Russia had provided sanctuary for the Jesuits after, after Pope Benedict XIV had outlawed the Jesuit order in 1773. While in Russia the Jesuits created schools and also performed perform social work until they left Russia after Benedict XIV was assassinated. They then founded the University of, of Louvain. At the university they developed the plan for a holy alliance which later became an integral part of the New World Order. Walsh was known to have been involved with this Louvain Jesuit network. Perhaps at this point in our narrative, it is well to point out that in the overall global scheme of things, the various Masonic Grand Masters, Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic, all report to an unknown superior, who is the Jesuit Superior General, also known as the Black Pope. The Black Pope, in turn, reports to the head of the Illuminati, who is known by his code name of Pindar. Note that Hillary Clinton held her press conference announcing her senatory candidacy at Pindar's corner. Halfon Parvis, who was one of the instigators of the Russian Revolution, also was one of the early architects of Soviet of the Soviet intelligence service known as the Cheka. In addition, he was the mentor of Trotsky, who attained a position of prominence within the trust due to his 
promotion of the concept of initiating revolution on a global scale. During the period of Walsh's sojourn in Russia, the rascal Nik Bakarin, another Parvis protege, joined to trust and became the Soviet dictator until ousted by Stalin for allowing the loot in the Soviet agricultural products. It was during the 1920s that Father Walsh became a member of the trust. After Stalin severed conflict contact with the trust and purged its Bolshevik members, Walsh began an association with Karl Hoshofer, head of the Nazi, head of the German Geopolitical Institute. It was Hoshofer who conceived the Nazi Liebenschrom, live in space policy, which Hitler used as a pretext to invade Czechoslovakia. Hoshofer was also the mentor of the deputy Reich Führer Rudolf Hess. Hess was a member of the Communist International Conference that was held in, the in 1920. He was accompanied at the conference by Soviet asset and anthro anthroposophist Rudolf Steiner, who also was a member of the Order Templi Orientis cult. Interestingly, Father Walsh was later appointed to head a prosecutorial team that was delegated to interrogate Karl Hoshofer at the uh, at the uh, Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal after the capitulation of Nazi Germany. Walsh's lack of intensive interrogation of Hoshofer presumably was for the purpose of suppressing any in and Verdant disclosures by Hoshifer regarding the trust. The schism within the trust that was initiated by Stalin prompted Western trust members to launch an anti communist campaign within the United States in an attempt to pressure the Soviets into restoring a pro trust faction within the Soviet power structure. According to the late American journalist Drew Pearson, it was Father Wash who sold Ch Senator Joseph McCarthy on the plan to hold congressional hearings and to allege subversive communist activities. Pearson's allegation later was substantiated in the writings of McCarthy counsel Roy Cohn and Father Walsh's protege, the Illuminati apologist Professor Carol Quigley of the Jesuit controlled university in his book Tragedy and Hope. Stalin's principal ally in accompanying his coup was also was a powerful rascal Nick faction in the Ukraine and President Bill Clinton pay tribute to his Jesuit mentor and New World Order asset quickly in his first presidential address. Now moving on. Now moving on. Since the trust in keeping with most subversive happenings in the world essentially has been an Illuminati activity directed as usual by their lackeys, the Jesuits, it is advisable to note that the Jesuits invariably incorporate into their convoluted strategies the precepts or articles of that ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu, and the Jesuits probably wrote the book The Art of War as well, but moving on, being cognizant of Sun Tzu's 13 precepts as outlined in his written work known as The Art of War makes it easier to track the evil machinations of the Jesuits. 
the rationale for Father Walsh to select Senator McCarthy as head of the Congressional Inquisitor of the hapless Hollywood Com of Inquisitor of hapless Hollywood Communist sympathizers was obvious. McCarthy was scheduled to begin preparations for his 1952 re-election campaign had several major skeletons in his closet. As a Nazi sympathizer, McCarthy had been associated with Fra Hedde Messing, a leading member of a Nazi spy ring which had connections to the Trust and also to Soviet spy master M.N. Roy. It was apparently Head Messing who persuaded McCarthy to intercede on behalf of Nazi SS officers who had received death, threat, death sentences by the Nuremberg Tribunal for their involvement in the infamous Malmati Massacre in which American prisoners of war were shot in cold blood. The senator also had a $10,000 bribe from a construction company that was under congressional investigation. McCarthy also was a known associate of the German Communist Party member Rudolf Aschenauer. McCarthy initially was linked to Father Walsh through Roy Cohn, a homosexual member of McCarthy's staff who later died of AIDS. Both the Las Vegas Sun newspaper and an FBI report claimed that McCarthy was a closet homosexual, suggestive that the senator may have been blackmailed by the Soviets, particularly since another FBI report alleged that there was a conspiracy instigated by Jesuit intelligence asset Cardinal Spellman and the late Joseph Kennedy to undermine the Eisenhower administration for the purpose of installing Senator Joseph McCarthy as President of the United States. Cohn was also a director of Permindex, a trading company linked to the assassination of President Kennedy. The Permindex CEO was British intelligence operative Major Louis Bloomfield. And I will talk more about Permadex in another show, but let's move on. It was on February 9, 1950, that Senator McCarthy gave his infamous speech at Wheeling, West Virginia, which misdirected the attention of the media away from the trust conspirators and also allowed McCarthy's numerous skeletons to remain undisturbed in their closet. The senator's congressional hearings, which had struck fear into the hearts of, the, of Hollywood's communist sympathizers, met their Waterloo when the council of the army, Welsh, made his rem memorable Have You No Shame speech at the army McCarthy hearings. By then, the damage had been done, however, truly subversive Soviet elements who had successfully penetrated Wall Street were more firmly entrenched than ever, and McCarthyites had attained high positions within the American intelligence community. Sadly, the communist behind every Bush mentality was fostered among the American populace by the McCarthy here and served to fan the flames of the phony Cold War which had been created by the military-industrial complex. A, a former OSS operative, according to a former OSS operative, you know, British anthropologist Margaret Mead, was also connected to Russian intelligence. On one day, a sec, on one day, the operative, the OSS operative's wife, the secretary, you know, answered a phone call and found that it was a social call from Nikita Khrushchev to Margaret Mead. 
interesting. And Nikita Khrushchev also said that the CIA and the KGB should be merged into one organization because the same people work for both organizations. But I'm getting off I'm getting off track here, so let's get back on track. It was McCarthyism. It was the McCarthyism hysteria which sealed the fate of nuclear physicists Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Regardless of whether or not they were guilty of passing nuclear secrets to the soul via the McCarthy hearings undoubtedly influenced the trial outcome and their subsequent executions. Hypocritically, key nuclear secrets, together with much of the American stockpile of fissionable nuclear materials, covertly had been flown to Russia in 1943 from a military airfield in Montana, Gore Field, under the direction of Truman aide Harry Hopkins, another Jesuit coadjutor, and probably. Roosevelt's real controller allegedly at, at the instigation of the Rockefeller family. <coughs> In conclusion, the data presented is indicative that communism did not commence with the Satanist Karl Marx as is popularly believed but has been an integral part of the rascal Nick ideology for centuries, with its emphasis on authoritarian state control of the masses. The fact that the hidden power structure behind the current Russian grand deception appears to be mainly composed of rascal Nick ideologues does not bode well for America and Western Europe, especially since Russia has established covert strategic alliances with China and Japan for the express purposes of embarking upon the military destruction of Western nations. Obviously, this the situation presents a clear and present danger especially when the treasonous Bill Clinton has provided China with advanced military technology and equipment, including propulsion systems for cruise missiles and a prototype handheld chemical fusion weapon, later having been illegally sold to China at an auction held at Redstone Arsenal, the bill is sale being written up as used furniture. Accor according to the late Sherman Skolnick, the founder of the Citizens Committee to Clean Up the Courts, an organization with an excellent track record and an inaccurate investigative report, and the Chinese secret police are firmly entrenched in America. Wang Jun, the alleged head of the Chinese secret police in America has visited President Clinton on several occasions. Moreover, he is the alleged law client of Whitewater investigator Kenneth Starr. Is this the reason why Starr appeared to be so lax in pursuing the dissemination of American secret military technology to the Chinese by Lenin? Most certainly. Well, now let us, perhaps the, op the optimum way to avert armed conflict is to present the situation, in the present situation, is to attempt to modify the mindset of Russian, Chinese, and Japanese public so they can no, so they no longer adhere to their present nationalistic cultural paradigms which hold that they are a master race. For example, the Japanese contemptuously refer to the Chinese as garlic eaters. 
the belief structure of political and military leaders has largely been determined since childhood by their overlords. To make matters worse, interracial communication between the masses has until recently been quite limited. Hence, it is sometimes difficult to comprehend the social mores of other nationalities, particularly if separated by vast geopolitical distances. Fortunately, a paradigm shift occurred through the commercialization of the Internet, which has facilitated dis the dissemination of a vast amount of knowledge on a global scare scale. No longer does public opinion have to be shaped by corrupt political spinmeisters doing the bidding of their Illuminati overlords. For the first time in recorded history, we the people have an opportunity to disseminate truth concerning political events through the internet to members of the public in far off lands. In this manner, public opinion can be shaped from the bottom up for a change, hopefully influencing political and military leaders in the process. If we avail ourselves of this international form of communication, we, we the people have an excellent opportunity to attune interracially and through sheer weight and numbers refuse to fight, fight wa wars fought for the self-aggrandizement of the Illuminati. If we fail in this endeavor, then with certitude we will have sown the seeds of our own destruction. Of our own destruction. Yes, and and this is from, and the speech was, contains parts of a book from a book, yeah, from a book called They Cast No Shadows by Brian Desborough. And, cut and more interesting books, you know, read the book Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution by Anthony Sutton. Another good book to read, although I don't agree with the conclusions, is the consp Ah, never mind. Ah, fuck, I forgot I was going to say. Now I'm starting to fade. You have yourself a good day.